Precaution, precaution, which I think is Spanish for um, Achtung, Achtung. Welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Um, and you know what? We're, we're about to go um, uh, veering off topic. And very often on the podcast, we have said, if it's not the Second World War, simply not interested. But we're making a, a major exception today. I'm going to say it's because it's a, uh, to do with an aeroplane that may... Uh, it's the Hawker, the Hurricane. There's your connection. That should do it, shouldn't it, Jim? Well, yeah, and also <laughs> one, of, one, of, one of the characters involved, he'd been in the Second World War. Yep. Um, yep. It's closer yep. to the Second World War than it is to today. Yeah, um, OK. It's the first time one squadron goes into action since the Second World War, I believe I'm right in saying. And actually, what's amazing reading Rhoda's book is just how familiar it all is. Yeah, you yeah, know. yeah, yeah. So we are joined today by Rhoda White. So we, we, we've gone off on one then. <laughs> It never happens. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, Ronan. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, you you you've written about the Falklands before, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, it was my first book. I mean, I, James was the very first person actually to even know I was thinking about it. Um, we went on a, a walk. Uh, near his house um, in, in, in Wiltshire. Uh, and I said, look, I've got this, this idea that I want to try and uh, write a story about um, the first Vulcan raid um, of the Falklands War, uh, which was, you know, the most remarkable British bombing raid since um, since Second World War. Uh, and, um, and I wanted to try and bring people right into the cockpit of that bomber and of the, the tankers that supported it. Um, and, you know, James, as he is, was very encouraging. So yeah, I think that's a great idea. Have a, have a crack at it. And so so I did. And, uh, you know, that was, I mean, that was 10, 15 years ago now. And so this is the first return with this Harrier book to the Falklands uh, since then. But as you say, there's, I mean, the, the the Falklands was so much closer to the end of the Second World War than uh, than we are to the Falklands now. And there were, you know, the three chiefs of the services, um, Henry Leach, um, Bramall, and uh, and Sir Michael Beetham, uh, had all served in the Second World War. And indeed, there were people down in the Falklands, uh, not least the captain of Atlantic Conveyor. He yeah, as yeah. Well. well, that's. I mean, it is the the peculiar umbilical cord, in fact, to the past in that respect that. That I suppose it is now gone, isn't it? It's mm. this, uh, and and you know, Thatcher's after all, uh, Peter Carrington had, had had served in Guards yeah. Armoured, and you know, uh, 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 obviously resigned over the uh, Falklands uh, debacle. Um, uh, so, so uh, how old were you when the when when the Falklands War happened? Uh, I was uh, eleven years old, and I was at school, and I remember it being the first time that I'd ever really engaged with the newspapers every day. You know, uh, and I, you, know, they're, they're, you get the you know Times, Telegraph, Mail every day, and he'd race to go and read them uh, and find out what news there was of uh, progress in the war. And I remember Ian McDonald, the uh, the Ministry of Defence um, spokesman, coming on the TV every day uh, w- with his sort of Coke bottle uh, glasses and the sort of fantastic mannered delivery announcing that you know yesterday in the Falklands the Sea Harrier fighter bomber aircraft had shot down three dagger mirage fighter bomber aircraft and um, I think there was there were efforts to sort of remove him because it was so peculiar uh, and there was such a public outcry because uh, we'd all got used to him and sort of grown to love him um, that, that anyone sort of considered sort of more professional and polished we, we, we just weren't having it. <laughs> I, so I was I was I was 14 and yeah. and um you know suddenly I mean and, and with an interest in military history suddenly you had this thing on yeah the, you had it happening on the television exactly and uh, uh um you 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 kind of got a blow by blow thing I mean obviously we didn't know everything that was going on but you kind of got a blow by blow thing you had d- drawings by David Ace was the graphic artist in the Daily yeah. Mail. You'd have a David Ace drawing, you know, of a, of yeah. a Harrier strafing goose green. And it was, <laughs> uh, when I was 14, it was utter, utter, utter catnip. I know, but, it was but, magic, yeah. But the thing that's central, in fact, to the British ability to pull off um, uh, the, the Falklands campaign is the, is the Harrier, isn't it? There's no, there's no, two, yeah. there's no two ways about it without that aircraft um, uh, the, the British government would have had to throw in the towel, go to the UN. And I know. Say, you're, oh, you're, you're, I mean, I think what's amazing right. about, about your book, though, Roland, is the fact that it took you so long to write it. Because, you know, when you're looking at the Harrier, 
I mean, frankly, what's not to like? I mean, it's it's an absolutely <laughs> incredible aircraft. Uh, and I'm amazed it took you so long to write about the air war of the Falklands. Yeah, I mean, no, since since um, since the book's been published, I've been wondering the same thing. I mean, what, what why on earth did it take me sort of 15 years to get to this after writing it, you know, Vulcan <laughs> 6 or 7? And I think and actually the the reason uh, there is a reason for that. I, I spoke to Tim Gedge, who's the the boss of 809 mm. Squadron. He's a, uh, he's, he's one of the heroes of the book really, isn't he? Yeah, he's very much a sort of central character there and, uh, and he's a, a, a lovely chap who had previously flown phantoms off hms arc royal and which is anyone who and sea vixens i mean anyone who grew up in the, the 70s will remember rod stewart wailing away to um to the sailor documentary and the phantoms and buccaneers flying off um off arc royal and that that too captured my imagination and, and here was a sort of um, more recent iteration of it so I'd said to Tim after writing about Ark Royal, actually, that I really wanted to to, to talk to him about 809's um, war during the Falklands and, and felt that it, it, it because there had been books about the Falklands Air War, that I hadn't really got away and it didn't feel like quite a sort of big enough subject um, for me to bring anything fresh to. Uh, and it wasn't until 2013 when it was announced that the first of the new, uh, or the first fleet air arm uh, F-35 joint strike fighter, which I don't suppose is um, uh, an airplane you hear much about on We Have Ways, uh, the new stealth jet, new stealth jet entering service with the, the Royal Air Force fleet air arm was going to be 809 Squadron. I thought, right, that's the way into this. You know, we 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 can bring the whole thing up to date by saying, and this is what 809 Squadron are up to. Uh, today and so that was when I dropped Tim a line and said look I know how to do this I know what I want to do I really want to tell 809 Squadron story and I realized as soon as I got in that this sort of short sharp account of 809's war that I thought I was going to write was 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 not going to yeah, be yeah yeah you got a little bit carried away on that much one didn't you? yeah yeah I really did it ended up being twice as big as I thought we've got 51 squadron you know photo reconnaissance doing spy mm. missions with nimrods and cameras and stuff yeah, you've yeah, got, yeah. you know you've got number one squadron with Peter Squire you've got Sharky Ward That's right. and all the rest of it but I think you know what what's what's so interesting about the Falklands war is it, the executioner's acts the kind of the the dreaded mm. governmental oh, yeah white paper is, is hovering over the Royal Navy and the Air Force and just every part of the kind of you know Britain's defences and, and and what's so fascinating is is that you know Tim Gedge is 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 has suddenly got a staff job and yeah. you know he's thinking that the latest carrier HMS Invincible is about to be sold to Australia that the the Navy and the and the Naval Air Squadrons are going to be absolutely savage and the next thing he knows he's saying you know actually we haven't got enough can you form another squadron yeah, yeah. I mean, the Navy was sort of um, feeling fantastically bruised at the time. I mean, John Knott was the Defence Secretary and had um, pushed through these very savage cuts to the Navy. And, and they, they, you know, we were, as we always are, sort of spending too much. And uh, he had to make a decision not, this is, about what the Navy was for, what the armed forces more generally were for. And at the time, the focus was on NATO and on the possibility of a war with the Soviet Union or the, the Warsaw Pact. And the Royal Navy's job, uh, in in that kind of encounter was going to be protecting the shipping lanes uh, from uh, Soviet submarines. And so the whole of the Royal Navy was really focused on that job uh, in support of the, the US Navy's uh, aircraft carriers, uh, big super carriers, uh, on anti-submarine warfare. And it's only sort of by the skin of its teeth that the Navy, through the existence of the Hawker Harrier, um, you know, Sydney Cam, the, the hurricane designer's last uh, aeroplane for Hawker, um, was able to uh, put some fixed wing aircraft on these small invincible class carriers uh, to act as a defence or a uh, deterrent to sort of Soviet maritime patrol aircraft. Um, and nothing more than that, really. Um, it was only by the skin of its teeth that he had that, that they had these um, this small number of fixed wing aeroplanes that might make possible, as Al was saying earlier, any adventure in the South Atlantic without those Harriers. And Henry Leach was absolutely clear, the chief of the naval staff. Without the Sea Harrier, there could have been no task force. And obviously without the task force, the Falklands would still be, um, you know, in Argentinian hands. I mean, there was just simply no doubt about it. We couldn't have sent a task force without um, the air cover. Because the Harriers are the only jet that can operate that far from Britain uh, on those carriers. Yeah. Well, and, the, and the, the Navy the Navy have wound down their strike capability anyway, because Buccaneer, you know, is a, is a low-level nuclear strike um, aircraft during the 70s, isn't it? Yeah. And and that all that all comes to the end because tried, you know, you've, I mean, part of it is the politics inside the Navy is that tr- Trident is the reason to keep the Navy going. Mm. 
actually, even now, if the money's running out, what you do is you put the money in the subs and you you get rid of the the, the duplication in the form of in the form mm. of um, uh, uh, Buccaneer. So it it is it is the most extraordinary mm. thing though that that weapon designed for something else ends up filling a filling a gap that no one ever imagined it was was required well it filled all the roles i mean uh, uh the, yeah. the captain of uh, of of hermes uh at the time lynn middleton uh said that the, or he described this, the sea harrier as a swiss army knife of jets and you know it had to do everything because there was nothing else that could take off from those little carriers there was nothing i mean what we haven't the expression we haven't used yet is jump jet. You know, the Harrier jump jet was the only successful vertical takeoff and landing aeroplane in the world. And it was had been up until this point uh, kind of rather um, loudly criticised and dismissed often as an aeroplane that couldn't carry a box of matches from one side of a football pitch to the other. And and it wasn't really taken seriously as a warplane by, by lots of people. You know, the senior people at the Pentagon said the British had simply no chance of pulling off uh, a victory in the South Atlantic. It was too far away. We had no, we didn't have super carriers like, like, I mean, Ark Royal was not a super carrier, but it had uh, an, a, some level of equivalence to those big American carriers in Phantoms and Buccaneers and early airborne early warning in the form of, of, of Gannets. And we just didn't have any of that. We had um, we had just 20. When the Task Force sells health, we had yeah. just 20, 20 Sea Harriers, 20 Sea Harriers, no airborne early warning, uh, and uh, just two very small aircraft carriers from which they could fly. I mean, my ch- my chest is on the one hand swelling with pride, on the other hand, kind of sort of sinking with despair. I kind of feel well, f- really conflicted. Well, by the, this. The, the folly, <laughs> the folly of the bloody thing. When you when you when you put it like that, and obviously that there is that moment where where Thatcher has to decide mm. what she's going to do, and there's the famous conversation is now, you know, yeah. we've got to do this or we won't matter as a country anymore. And I, I I'm I'm ambivalent about that idea anyway. Because after all, there's a school of thought that says the Falklands, the Falklands is the thing that then leads, the success of the Falklands campaign is the thing yeah. that leads to British military overconfidence. You can do, we can punch above our weight and all this, sort of, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, all the way uh, to uh, Iraq. Uh, uh, all the way to mm. Iraq. But, but the, je- so the, 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 I mean, the Harrier was notoriously unsafe as well. It was a tricky aeroplane to, to learn uh, to fly and yeah. all that stuff. Well, there's another uh, another uh, joke which sort of does the circles in the sort of Harrier world, which is how, how do you know if somebody's a Harrier pilot? Because they'll tell you. Um, and uh, I did that. You know, they they definitely regarded themselves as um, you know a cut above, and uh, you know it was a, a difficult aeroplane to fly. I mean. It, it was uh, probably at about the limit of what reasonably you could expect a, 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 a sort of squadron, a service pilot to fly. Um, but the, I mean, the, the, the amazing thing down in the Falklands, particularly with respect to 809, which was this squadron pulled together after the invasion. So we only had two frontline squadrons at the time of the invasion, each of which was nominally only five aeroplanes strong. So, so, I mean, this is real sort of, you know, skin of the teeth stuff. So Tim Gedge, um, uh, five days after the invasion, actually on the day that the um, the, the fleet sailed, uh, was asked to form a new squadron. And he had only two months earlier relinquished command of 800 Naval Air Squadron. Um, and so he, he drove to Yeovilton, was told he had to get his uh, airplanes and his pilots ready uh, to go south in three weeks time, which meant that he was pulling jets off the British aerospace production line, getting them out of attrition reserves at St. Athen, pulling them out of test squadrons at Boscombe Down and at Dunsfold, where British aerospace uh, uh, developed the jet, and then tr- scrambling to find pilots from around the world. He found um, a pilot in, on exchange in California and Arizona. Uh, there was one in Australia who was learning to fly fly as an air warfare instructor with the Australian And it's Navy. amazing because they're flying back across the Atlantic, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, and they're yeah. flying yeah, back they're across the Atlantic them. and literally landing and then going straight to Yeovilton. Yeah, but the best of them are the two RAF pilots who are kind of in the bar on Friday night and the squadron, uh, the the station commander comes and asks them what they're doing on Monday. So, oh, you know, we're going down to, you know, Guttersloe or whatever to do some air combat training with the Phantoms. Um, and he says, oh, no, you're not. You're off to Yeovilton. We've got some good news and bad news. You're going to war, uh, but you're going to war with the Navy. And so these guys who'd, who'd <laughs> n- n- never flown off an aircraft carrier, they'd never flown a sea harrier, um, but had some experience flying lightnings before they joined uh, three squadron flying Harriers in Germany, uh, found themselves flying backwards uh, in a back piston engine Pembroke uh, to uh, to Yeovilton uh, to join 809 Naval Air Squadron, where 
they had, I mean, less than 10 hours training in a Sea Harrier um, before going south uh, aboard Atlantic Conveyor. And I mean, that, as you well know, I mean, you know, even even Battle of Britain, um, Spitfire and Hurricane pilots were given more than 10 hours on the OCU before they joined the frontline squadrons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's no, amazing. But but they they kind of sort of pull it off, though, don't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they do. I mean, uh, the John Leeming, who was one of those RAF pilots, uh, uh, uh was tipped into battle in defence of um, uh, in or the effort to, to defend HMS Arden uh, from uh, from attack, and found himself sitting on the tail of an Argentine Skyhawk, um, trying just pressing every button he could to try and get the sidewinders to to fire. I mean, you know, got this sort of the the famous sidewinder growl in his headphones, um, and and he just couldn't get the bloody things to go. And eventually, as he was getting closer and closer, this thing was filling up his gun sight. He switched to guns and just started sort of drilling it with thirty millimeter Aiden rounds. Yeah, and and the thing broke up and exploded in front of him, and he just flew through the fireball. Thought that's you know sort of ducked below the combing, um, and uh, tried to make himself feel small, feeling sure that flying through this cloud debris was going to bring him down too. Um, and the, the, you know the reason he couldn't find the sidewinders because he he just forgotten how to do it after you know half an hour's training, <laughs> um, and so you know it's a, sort of the first 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 fast jet guns kill of the uh, the Falklands War. We're talking to Roland White about Harrier eight oh nine. Welcome back. We're talking to Roland White about the Falklands War and his new book, Harry 809. What training did they do on the journey south then, if 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 any? Was it all theoretical or did all they get the- Yeah, all theoretical. It was it was uh, kind of lectures. Uh, I mean, they had a sort of program of training, uh, very little of which was in the air. Um, I mean, you know, one of the so that they were it was they were flying by helicopter the the one squadron Harrier pilots over to Atlantic Conveyor uh, when the weather permitted it. They were getting uh, you know ground training um, there. Uh, on which the RAF and the Navy sometimes had very different um, uh, views. Um, and uh, they, they kept one of the Sea Harriers on the pad on Atlantic Conveyor, ready to scramble uh, to intercept potentially Argentine 707 um, that were trying to shadow the, the, the mm. task, task group's progress south. And that would have been the first time that they'd launched a fighter from a merchant ship since the days of the Hurricats and the merchant Yes, merchant yes, yes. And that's Winkle Brown, you know, isn't it? Yeah, you know, you know, firing these hurricanes off. Um, I mean, that. I mean, there's a, there's a lovely story about the Condors. Yeah, there's a, the very first time that happened, it was a pilot called Bob Everett um, who was fired in a clapped out old fighter from a merchant ship um, when the the uh, the convoy was being threatened by a Condor, and he shot it down. Um, and he said it was the most exciting thing he'd ever done. And it obviously had to bail out and then get rescued from the sea. And, and, and that's saying something, because this was a man who'd previously won the Grand National. Uh, I mean, and, and I love those stories that you sort of stumble on when you're doing the research for these books. The, 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 these extraordinary characters that you, you come across. So, yeah, Bob Everett um, nearly found uh, kind of a successor in Tim Gedge or Dave Braithwaite, who was a senior pilot on 809. I mean, they, they were actually scrambled and then that... that uh, decision to uh, to launch them was pulled off but you know it would have been a hell of a thing and they I mean they had mixed feelings about it being pulled off I mean on the one hand they both wanted to be the first person to to take a jump jet off a merchant uh, ship and shoot down an enemy aircraft on the other hand they both knew that they're very very unlikely to to get back on board um, <laughs> I mean Roland I, one of the things that just surprised me w- w- was just how much what what an important i hadn't kind of really appreciated just the role of the of the air battle and just how much fighting there was and air combat there was i mean it's extraordinary and i think one of the things that that i thought also i thought was really interesting was how um you also included the experience of the argentinians and there was yeah. that there's that one com- air combat where al craig and sharky ward are chasing that Picara, is that how you pronounce it? A Picara? Yeah, yeah, that's right, Picara. With, yeah, with, w- with Juan Tomba in, and and mm. he's getting absolutely shot to bits, uh, hammered, a- yeah, absolutely hammered. And you know, and and Sharky Ward sees the um, sees the, the the plane start, you know, the wings start to go, and then the kind of cockpit starts to go, and flames start to appear, and and then suddenly the Martin Baker ejector seat comes in, yeah. and this guy survives. I mean, it's just incredible. Yeah. Oh, no, I mean, those, I mean, I was very, very lucky. I mean, I said I'd planned to do this sort of short, sharp account of 809's war. And it, 
wasn't until I started getting into the research, I, I, I suddenly realised that, of course, nobody's written about the air war since the records were declassified, which meant I had a sort of stack of files after going to the National Archives um, that, that were, I mean, that were essentially kind of virgin with respect to, to writing about the air war. So that was a source of amazing material. But also, um, you know, Al, you've kind of illustrated this earlier in the podcast. I mean, Google Translate was my friend. Um, you know, all of those um, Argentine uh, veterans have been interviewed extensively by Argentine newspapers and magazines. And a lot of those interviews are online. Um, and uh, I don't speak Spanish, but I could use Google Translate to get the gist of what they were saying and also sort of bring a little bit of, uh, you know, my own understanding of what I'm writing about to to make it a, an accurate translation rather than a, than a literal translation of what, what was intended, getting the sort of technical aspects of it. So I was able to weave in the Argentine pilot's experience in a way that, again, I don't think had really been done before. And, you know, they were brave, skilled and, uh, you know, fantastically committed um, and believed that the cause was noble as well. And I hope I've really done justice to 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 their side of the story as well. Certainly there was no lack of respect between the British and the Argentine pilots, either then or or indeed subsequently. I think that, that you know, they felt that they were both, uh, you know, worthy opponents. So they were flying, the Argentinians were flying all sorts of different sorties, weren't, yeah. weren't they? Because, I mean, you intimated that, that they're... they're, they're trying to ghost the convoy mm -hmm. they're they're sending up famously the exocet um yeah. uh, uh, mirages out but what else and then trying to trying to interdict at san carlos water mm -hmm. they're, they're sending uh, skyhawks in in particular to to try and uh, attack british shipping but what else what else are they doing because they've you like you say they're very very busy yeah, well, I mean, there was no lack of um, kind of ingenuity on the Argentine side either. You know, they had um, chaff dispensers built by a, um, a company that made pasta. Um, I, I think they, they chopped up the aluminium foil uh, for the for the chaff, which, as, as I'm sure people know, uh, is a way of kind of breaking a radar lock using pasta makers. Uh, they fitted uh, bombs beneath the wings of their C-130 Hercules transport planes. And in fact, sank, sank I mean, you know that's not that not necessarily the finest hour, but they um, they hit and sank a, a oil carrier um, near the end of the war, uh, which is the largest single uh, tonnage I think at that point ever sunk by by air, um, and they were flying sort of uh, they had a sort of paramilitary organisation called the Phoenix mm. Squadron, yeah, uh, which was used yes, to Lear um, jets and stuff, yeah, Lear it? jets, uh, um, Hawker HS one two five business jets used to sort of misdirect, but also as um, uh, communications relay um, yeah. uh, points as well. But they had two former uh, Lancaster pilots flying those, RAF veterans who'd flown. I mean, one of them had bombed Berchtesgaden at the end of the Second World War as a Lancaster pilot, an Anglo-Argentinian who absolutely was committed to the cause that Malvinas were uh, Argentinian. And he was flying Learjets in support of uh, Skyhawk uh, and Mirage missions during the war. By uh, two wow. of them, actually. Yeah, wow. Tito. Yeah. So the Tito umbilical cord, numbers. the umbilical cord reaches to Argentina on both sides. Yeah, Gosh. yeah, yeah. Argentina, that's incredible. Yeah, and uh, and then I mean we haven't even talked about Chile yet. I mean <laughs> they were in the thick of it all as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Well, and, that's yeah, amazing. That, that that was a, a sort of a whole diplomatic mission, wasn't it, to mm. enable those spy missions to take place. Yeah, I mean that that was fun. I mean that that was one of the discoveries uh, as I sort of got into the uh, to the archives was these sort of fleeting references to things w which were in substance redacted. Um, Operation Folklore, Operation Acme, RAF operations mounted from Chile uh, that were clearly providing intelligence to the task force uh, and early warning of air attacks. I mentioned we didn't have airborne early warning. We didn't have a sort of uh, the equivalent of sort of AWACS providing us with um, warning and information about those low-level air attacks. And so we were dependent on intelligence from the mainland or uh, and to an extent from submarines that were sitting off the coast of Argentina. Um, and this was provided a number of different ways. Uh, one was a uh, dispatch of a, an RAF mobile radar to uh, to Chile. And that was flown over just before the fighting started uh, with a 10-man uh, RAF uh, radar operating crew. Um, there was a, an RAF um, attache dispatch to negotiate with the Chilean, um, Chilean Air Force, uh, who was in Santiago throughout the war. 
Um, and there was a sort of a team of signalers, not actually SAS signalers, signals regiment, SAS support signalers in the head of the uh, Air Force Intelligence um, HQ, uh, relaying information um, from those radars and from SAS observation um uh, post down there in Chile and there was um, this 51 Squadron Nimrod operating off a sort of remote South Pacific Island base flying secret missions with Chilean Air Force Chilean Navy personnel on board and one occasion it got um, it was intercepted by the Chilean Air Force and sort of dived to low level over the Beagle Channel to try and get away not knowing kind of quite what was going on uh, another occasion it lost an, air, an engine and came screaming into this island which was literally a runway which went from cliff to cliff, uh, one engine down with no reverse thrust um, and blew up uh, the main wheel assembly and burst the brakes and stuff. So they they then had to uh, fly. They were kind of off games for four days after that. They had to uh, fly in a new engine, uh, new main wheel uh, assembly to get the the jet airborne again. Um, And then after that interception and the sort of second near miss, they decided that possibly uh, discretion was better part of valour. And that was um, that was sent. So, I mean, that would have been a huge diplomatic incident, um, uh, seeing a, a Nimrod shot down um, or lost in the South Pacific with uh, senior Chilean uh, personnel on board. No, no hiding that one. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is, is it, it's I mean, it strikes me that so many of the of the decisions that the uh, the the ship's captains and commanders have to make are really echo the decisions of the Second World War as well. And there's a yeah. there's a time where um, Sandy Woodward is kind of sort of thinking about Admiral Cunningham in the in the Mediterranean um, and the evacuation of Crete. Uh, and there is a sort of irony because, of course, you know, the, the, the British land uh, on the Falklands on the same day that the Germans invade Crete in 1941, but in yeah. 1982, yeah, so 41 yeah. years later. But, I mean, it seems to me that the, the, the big conundrum for Sandy Woodward, who's a, the admiral in charge of task force, is, is how far do you push in your aircraft carriers? Because yeah. the closer you get to the Falklands, the more the, the greater they're at risk from the Argentinian Air Force, who, after all, massively outnumber in terms of aircraft mm-hmm. what the British can bring yeah. to bear. But on the other hand, if you don't, if you're not aggressive, you're not going to be able to do what you need to do. So you've got this kind of it's kind absolutely. of it's I mean, calculated risk, isn't it? Yeah, that's absolutely the tension for for Woodward throughout. And you read his memoir, which is exceptional, a uh, hundred days, and you realise the extent to which he's sort of bearing responsibility for for that. Uh, I mean, alone essentially, uh, because there are competing arguments on both sides. There are some more aggressive um, captains pushing for a decision to move closer to the Falklands. There are others who are saying, you know, Woodward himself particularly, knows that should he lose one of those carriers, particularly Hermes, which was the bigger of the two, um, you know, he'd have to pack up and go home. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there was, an, there's another echo of the Second World War here as well, in that, that with the absence of early war, airborne early warning, they were having to use the uh, the escorts, uh, the, the frigates and the destroyers as picket ships. And that was, of course, exactly what was happening in, during the, the Pacific war um you know you're having to put radar pickets uh, a long way uh, isolated radar pickets a long way ahead of the main task force that could provide some kind of early warning of an incoming um air attack um and so that was you know that was why sheffield was lost it was why coventry was lost in that they were so far ahead of the fleet um providing both air defense but also a, a airborne um early warning and partly because there was experience of Second World War still at senior levels in the Navy. Um, people like John Fieldhouse and Henry Leach had fought in Second World War. Uh, not an appetite for, but an acceptance of uh, the possibility that you would lose ships. You know, we were, as you talked about Crete, I mean, that was after Crete that ABC, didn't he say something like, it takes 300 years to, to, to build a tradition, but three months to build a ship. Or words to that effect. And and that was very much in the minds of people like Fieldhouse and Leach at a time when uh, John Knott, the defence secretary, was really freaking out about how the loss of these uh, destroyers and frigates was playing out in the press back home. It it made it look like we were losing. Those escorts uh, are are, um, expendable, essentially. You know, you you, you have as many as you need expecting to lose some in in pursuit of the the greater gain, in pursuit of victory. Uh, And and the policy works because ultimately they do, you know, the, the, the Argentinian air forces repeatedly try and sort of attack the aircraft carriers and they always get repulsed, don't they? You know, Skyhawks being shot down and 
and all the rest of it. And actually, it's it, isn't it Exeter? Exeter and um, Exeter is one of the ones that kind of shoots down one of the scorpions. Yeah, 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 by. yeah, yeah. I mean, there were there were five separate. They had five Exocet missiles, and uh, I mean, another part of the book which was fascinating was the the sort of the MI six efforts uh, that there were around the world to uh, to prevent them getting hold of more Exocet missiles. They had five air launched Exocet missiles. I should add, um, launched from Super Etendards, these sort of French strike jets, and uh, the Sheffield was lost in the first attack. Um, there was uh, the second attack saw the end of Atlantic Conveyor, and that's a fascinating story in in and of itself. Um, and then the fifth attack, um, even though uh, it, it was launched successfully, um, was essentially foiled through a combination of different things. There was um, sort of passive countermeasures, uh, that's the chaff and the disposition of your ships, and there were active countermeasures, which is firing missiles and guns, and, and one of those shot down uh, the uh, one of the attacking Skyhawks. But the result was, and the Navy was very clear about this in its report on the, that attack of the 30th of May, which was the last air-launched exit attack, you know, we 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 succeeded in defeating this attack you know this didn't hit one of the ships we foiled it and while uh it it uh, was a through a combination i mean even the disposition of the ships is critical but not terribly sexy uh w- while it was a combination of different elements that that protected the carriers and on that case those that combination of elements was successful in protecting the carriers so job done that's all we have time for today in our interview with Roland white But there's part two coming out very soon where we'll carry on talking about the Falklands. Cheerio!